Okay. So I'm going to ask you to go with me to Deuteronomy 16. If you're visiting us tonight, we have visitors here with us tonight. God bless you for being with us. Uh, you'll be wondering, did we just arbitrarily pick Deuteronomy 16 to preach from tonight? We go through the Bible. We're going through Deuteronomy right now on Wednesday nights. I'm just completing Second Peter uh, chapter, uh, chapter 3 this Sunday. But I want to talk to you tonight from Deuteronomy chapter 16 abide. You know what? Stand with me for the reading of God's word. And um, I want you just to take notice of as we go through this passage. Uh, essentially, it's describing three pilgrimage festivals. We know there are seven. But there are the specific three that are mentioned here is because they were pilgrimage festi festivals. And uh, the people would travel, okay? Essentially, they would travel to the tabernacle, and then when the temple was built, they would travel to the temple for these um, feasts. So in verse 1 of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, Observe the month of Abid, and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abid, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd. Uh, in place where the Lord chooses to put his name. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is uh, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt and all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight, remain overnight until morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, uh, with uh, which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall roast and eat it, in the place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tent. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin uh, to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord uh, your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, uh, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you, at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, and you shall uh, gather from uh, the threshing floor and from the winepress, and you shall rejoice in the feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, and the Levite, uh, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep uh, the sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that uh, you uh, shall surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Father, just open our hearts to your word. Lord God, I know, Lord God, many here, uh, they, Lord God, from the past weeks, from the past months, they understand the significance, Lord God, of these seven feasts and the three that are mentioned here. Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that you would impress upon our hearts tonight the significance of, Lord God, coming to the place where you abide and abiding, Lord, in you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. So, again, Deuteronomy chapter 16 describes three pilgrimage festivals, okay? You have the, the Peshach, okay, uh, the, the Passover. You have uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, you have Shavuot, 
okay, if I'm saying it right, the Feast of Weeks. And then you have Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. Again, what makes this passage unique, they were three pilgrimage, okay, feasts. We've gone through the seven feasts. Let me just, I'm going to give you just a quick little run through to understand the seven feasts. You have the four spring feasts, and then you have the three fall feasts, uh, the, the fall uh, feasts. The Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Church, Pentecost, the Spring Feast, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles, okay, are the Fall Feasts. Now again, notice only three of the seven are mentioned here because again, God is calling the people as they are preparing to enter into the Promised Land that they are three feasts, again, of pilgrimage. What's key to understand in understanding the seven feasts of Israel, they are all foreshadows of who? Of Yeshua. Okay, they are all foreshadows of Jesus. So in Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17, so let no one judge you in the food or in drink or regarding to festival or new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. They were shadows of Jesus. They were typologies. Okay, foreshadows of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 10, 1 again, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those uh, who approach perfect. So again, the seven feasts are seven shadows, seven typologies of Yeshua. And you look into it, and we'll look into it a little more deeply here. Essentially, the, the Passover, I'll come over here, the Passover was a typology of Jesus' death the sacrificing of the Passover lamb, the Feast of Unleavened Bread of his burial, the Feast of First Fruits, his resurrection, the Feast of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus has fulfilled those four feasts. The three feasts of the fall holiday, and what you look here is, and it's really neat, because between the first four and then the last three, there is this gap. We are in the church age. When the Lord come back, comes back, he will fulfill the fall holidays. Feast of trumpets. What has to sound before the rapture occurs? The trumpet. That is the fulfillment of the feast of trumpets. Day of atonement. The Jewish people will turn to Yeshua in repentance. And we see that in the book of Zechariah. We see that book of Revelation chapter 7 chapter 14 but there will be a coming home of the Jewish people to their Messiah the hardening will have ended of their hearts and that will be fulfilled day of atonement and then the feast of tabernacles is fulfilled in the millennial kingdom where now humanity the saved humanity Jew and Gentile will dwell with the Lord Right? Revelation chapter 20 for a thousand years mentions it six times. So uh, I'll bring you back here to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Just look at verse 6 again. But at the place where the Lord, okay, at the place where Elohim, your God, Yahweh, chooses to make his name. What is significant about his name? to make his name abide. The, the name of God, and every name of God that you see in Scripture, is a description of his nature, of his character, of his essence. So the, the, name, the name Elohim, and Elohim is the first name of God we find in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, 1, right? In the beginning, right? God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Elohim describes God as the mighty creator, Right? El Shaddai. You guys know. Who knows what El Shaddai means? It's El, Sh El Shaddai is essentially um, God Almighty. Yeah. God Almighty. El Shaddai is, is God Almighty. Um, Yahweh Yaira. Yahweh Yaira. Right? Jehovah Jireh. The Lord shall provide. He's the provider. Yahweh Rapha. Oh, by the way, I'm using, I'm using the Hebrew 
not the Greek, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses come along and they say, well, God's name is, is uh, Jehovah. That, that is a Greek translation that was done many years later. The Hebrew is, his names are, are Yahweh, Adonai, El Shaddai. So, uh, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Uh, here's one that will make you think a little bit. Yahweh Tusori. Anybody? Tusori means rock, the Lord, our rock. So all those are just names. You know, you, if, if you can, I mean, there are wonderful books written on the names of God. You look at the Hebrew names of God. It's a great study to do. You'll come to understand more and more deeply who God is. A great revelation through his name. So it's significant here. Again, he will choose a, a, to, a, essentially a place where his name, where his presence, where his essence, where his, his character will abide. Now, those places are very clear in right, the Tanakh, in the, in the Old Testament. You have the tabernacle. And then eventually you have the building of the temple, Solomon's temple. What's, imp what's important, those were significant places where God, in a very unique way, manifested his presence to the people, right, who were coming and worshiping him and seeking him. Now, I just want to show you, in Acts chapter 7, 48 through 50, when Stephen is giving his sermon... He quotes here from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. He says, however, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? But God is essentially is omnipresent. God fills all things. He is everywhere. He is here with us tonight. Okay, it's not, not because it's a church. He's in the house that you live in. He tonight will be in the bed that you sleep in. He will be in the bathtub that you take a bath in. Okay, he's in the kitchen that you cook your food in. God is God is in, in all places, right? In him we live and move and have our being, right? That was the, the quote that Paul gives when he was talking to the the Athens philosophers. But he manifests himself in certain places in very unique ways. The tabernacle. That is where the people of Israel were called to come and worship him. He abided in a very unique way in the tabernacle. That they broke down and they put up as they wandered again through the desert. He manifested himself and dwelt in a very unique way in Solomon's temple. That's key. When Jesus came, right, we know this, in John uh, chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh, right? John begins with verse 1, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Then he says, and the Word became flesh, and he uses the word dealt. The word is skinu. The word can be translated tabernacled, tent, uh, dwelling, uh, tent encampment. So what is being said here, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us that, again, in Jesus, we now have the very manifestation, okay, of God. He is God with us, right? He is Emmanuel, God with us. And again, it goes on and says, Among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you want to know what God is like, where should you go? All right, you go to Jesus. Want to know what the Father is like? You go to the Son. Look at um, Colossians 1, 15 through 19. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, by the way, that's important. The first one over all creation is not saying that he was created. He is the first one to what? The first one to be raised from the dead and not to die. So, right, everybody in the Old Testament who was raised from the dead, they eventually died. Jer right, you have Jairus' daughter would eventually die. Lazarus eventually died. But he, he is the firstborn over all creation, the risen Savior. It's not saying that he is created. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. You know what this is? He holds all things together. 
Remember, we, we talk about that, that unknown, that unknown force that holds the atom together. Right? Strong force, weak force, they get into all the, right, those things, and, but it is ultimately his force. <laughs> and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, for it, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. John chapter 14, conversation, right, with the apostles. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and uh, it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, you have been with me so long, and yet you have not known me. Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus, again, the, the tabernacle was a shadow. The temple was a shadow. The fulfillment of it all, right, is in Jesus. So, I'll take you again on this journey tonight. What is a Christian? And there's a lot of different, I mean, if, if, if you Google and ask the question, what is a Christian, you get a lot of different answers. Uh, a Christian is someone who goes to church. A Christian is somebody who has been baptized. Uh, a Christian is somebody who professes belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, a Christian is somebody who belongs to Christianity. You know what that, none of those answers, by the way, are what Jesus said and what the Bible says. I want to give you, I want to give you a, a very simple definition of what a Christian is. And if you go to John chapter 15, and I'll just focus here on verse 5. I'm not going to read the entire passage. Of the vine and the branches, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. A, a Christian is somebody who abides in Jesus and of whom Jesus abides. The, the Christian is somebody who has Jesus living in them through the Spirit. What is that? You, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Spirit. So a Christian is somebody who has, again, God indwells them. They are indwelt by, you know, Jesus. And they also abide in him. What, is it, what does it mean to abide? To remain, to dwell, to cling to. If you're a Christian, do you realize he's clinging to you right now? And if you're a Christian, he's not going to let you go. And you will be clinging to him imperfectly. Sometimes better than others, right? Sometimes we do far better clinging to Jesus. But he, he, is, he is always clinging to us. And that, that is a key thing. He's holding us. So, I said, let me take one of the apostles. I think one of the, the apostles who I can use as an example tonight to best describe what it is to abide in Jesus. And I decided to pick John. Okay? The Apostle John. The beloved. I'm the one whom Jesus loves. He says over and over again. He is the fisherman, right, from Galilee. He works for his father and the Zebedee Fishing Company. He has a brother. His name is Andrew, who's also a, a, a follower and a Christian, one who abides in Jesus. Seems to have a bad temper, at least during Jesus' ministry, right? Um, and Jesus gave him the name, right, with his brother, Sons of Thunder. They seem to have very bad tempers. Uh, he's the one who laid his head upon Jesus' heart at the Last Supper, right? heard the heartbeat of God and he is somebody who abided in Jesus and he is somebody that Jesus abided in from the beginning to the end so I'm just going to show you I'm going to show you the beginning and the end and I'm going to show you some things in between so the beginning John chapter 1 verse 35 to 39 and it says, again, the next day, John stood with his two disciples. That's John the Baptist, and he's got two disciples here. I believe that they are Andrew and John. 
fact, we, we pretty much agree as teachers that they are Andrew and John, though John is not mentioned. You notice John never mentions his name as he goes through his, um, his uh, gospel. Well, she see that a number of times tonight. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which uh, is to say, uh, when translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying. And notice, and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. I want you to see the word remained. The word is meno. It's the same word that's used in John chapter 15 over and over again about abiding. They remained with him. They were abiding with him. This is really the, this is like kind of the, the, the first step. Now, let me take you to Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. This is the ascension of Jesus. So to, say, so to speak, this is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry because John abided in Jesus from the beginning to the end. And then further on, <laughs> Acts I'm going to show you something when we wrap up tonight that will blow your mind. So now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel and who also said, and notice men of Galilee, I would think that John is in this group because he was certainly in what followed with Pentecost. Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Here is John. He was with Jesus right from the beginning, abiding in him, abiding in him till the end. At least the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. I think that after the little meeting where they spent that day with Jesus, uh, a day or two later, Matthew chapter 4, 21 and 22, going on from there, he saw the two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father and mending their nets, and he called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And here now again, this is the abiding, the abiding in Jesus. There's a key connection between following Jesus and abiding in Jesus. You cannot, you cannot be abiding in Jesus and not be following Jesus. Now, there come as you go through you go through the Gospels, there are just some incredible abiding experiences that John has. And as you are abiding in Christ, you will look at these things and you will find that, that many of these experiences you have had or you are having or you will have. So one of the, the wonderful things about, about John his relationship with Jesus, he's one of the three inner circle men. So Jesus had an inner circle, and one was John, one was Peter, right, and one was James. And those three got to experience some things that the others didn't. The raising of Jairus' daughter. Remember, they went up, and there were people weeping and crying and carrying on and mourning. And what did Jesus do? He put them all out, just kept the mother and the father and the three right, of the inner circle in there, and he took the little girl with his hand, and he says, Talitha kumi, little lamb, rise. And they got to see that little girl being raised from the dead. And could you imagine the joy of her parents? So they got to experience that, that, very, that very unique miracle. And when we are abiding in Jesus, I believe there are miracles that we will experience. Uh, abiding in Jesus, they experienced um, some spectacular times. Again, he, he took the three up onto the Mount of Transfiguration where he was transfigured in his glorified state, right? They, fall, they fell down on their faces like dead men. And then you have Moses and Elijah appearing, um, you know, with them. But they got, they got to see a glimpse of Jesus in his glorified state. Abiding in Jesus at times will take us into difficult places. 
difficult times because he took the three with him further than the others when he went deeply into Gethsemane and they fell asleep. They rebuked him, right? Three times, you know, can't you stay awake? Watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Let me just say this. That was a very difficult time. I think that we live sometimes with regrets. And I think that John probably lived with that regret. You know, he loved Jesus. He loved his Savior. He loved his Lord. And he lived with that regret that he couldn't just stay awake. And just, like he, look, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to, be some type of you know, great strength with Jesus, but he just could have been there and been a comfort to Jesus in this very trying time. So I think that, again, sometimes we go through difficult times as we're abiding in the Lord. Times, as we're walking with the Lord, there'll be times of, um, of rebuke when you're abiding in Christ. He will rebuke you. And in Luke chapter 9, 53 and 56, it, it, it tells us this, that as they were walking through Samaria, the Samaritans were not believers, plus they didn't like Jesus because he was heading up to Jerusalem. And it says, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. He he rebuked them. And rebuke is, this is a sharp disapproval. When God God rebukes you, it will be it will be cutting. Right? If you've ever you've ever experienced God's rebuke in your life, it's 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 a cutting, sharp disapproval. He's just letting you know, hey. That's not right. You're not walking right. You need to repent. Another time, the Zebedee boys, John and James, they, um, they had their mother come to Jesus and try to, you know, when you get into your kingdom, I want my boys on your right and left hand. Now, I'll just tell you, Mrs. Zebedee, they put her up to this because they're right there. They're watching this whole thing. And I want to see this in Matthew chapter 20, 24, 28. And when the the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, let me tell you, this is, when you're abiding in Jesus, you're going to have course uh, course corrections. The Lord is, and I'm, I'm not so much talking here about a rebuke, but there are times you're not walking right with him. And he, he is going to let you know, you need to change your course. You're not thinking right. You're not, you're not believing right. You think, you know, in this case, you're thinking like the people of the world. You ha- you have a worldly mindedness instead of thinking like a kingdom servant. And he will give you course corrections. Okay, next. There'll be intimate times. When you are abiding in Jesus, you will have, let me tell you, some wonderful intimate times with him. And I believe that we can have an intimacy with God through Jesus that is greater than any any intimacy we could have with another human being. But at the Last Supper, right, John places his head upon Jesus' chest. Right, he is again, he is the one that Jesus loves. He's likely the youngest of the apostles, And it's likely he wrote the book of the Revelation somewhere around 90 to 96 A.D. And um, he he outlived them all by 30 years. But I think that he had this this intimate relationship. You know, John, 
Mary Magdalene. There's an intimacy that they had with Jesus that was very unique. And that is something, that is something he invites us all to come in. And when we, again, when we're abiding in him, we will have these intimate times, intimate moments. Uh, John uh, chapter 18, verse 16. There will be distant times where we are not going to sense his presence like maybe we had weeks before. We're going to feel distant from him. In John 18, verse 16, after Jesus was arrested, they all deserted him, but Peter and John actually followed him from a distance. And again, this is an instant where John's name is not mentioned, but I believe this is John who is, again, writing about this, and this is obviously something he would know. And it says, but Peter stood at the outside, uh, at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known by the high priest, I believe he was known by the high priest because the Zebedee Fishing Company probably provided fish for them. They hauled down the fish from, you know, the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. And he went and spoke uh, to her, who kept the door and brought Peter in. Now, again, you'll notice, again, there's a distance. Just a, a short time ago, he had his head upon the bosom of Jesus. And now there is this, this distance that is occurring. Now, that distance can occur because, I mean, the most likely thing that you're probably sitting there thinking about is it occurs because of sin. And sin in our lives that we're not repenting from or, or, or turning from. Sometimes it can be occurring because of a lack of trust. Limited understanding of him. Uh, sometimes there will be a distance that occurs because God is trying to teach us to live by faith and not by sight or emotions. It has nothing to do with, with sin in, in our lives. It has, it has nothing to do with a lack of trust. But I think some, sometimes we, we start to mistake our emotions for Jesus in our lives. And, and there are times, again, where there will be a distance that's occurring, but he's teaching us to walk by faith. In, in other words, look, although you may not be feeling it, I'm with you. Although you may not be feeling it, I love you. Although you may not be feeling it, I am here with you. Because the people, and people in the church who live by feelings, that's a, that's a sign of immaturity. Right? They're, they're driven by these feelings and by these emotions instead of being driven by faith and living by faith. So there are times, there are times where, where God will do that, but there are times where we will feel distant from Him. It, it doesn't mean that He's left us. But He's still holding us. He's still abiding with us. Uh, there are times when we're abiding in the Lord that can be extremely painful times. So John was the only apostle who was at the cross. John, Mary, Mary, and Mary. <laughs> but John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopos, Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her uh, to his own home. But this was a painful, heart-wrenching time for John to stand there with his mother, right, Mother Mary, as well as Mary Magdalene, watching him die. So there are times, there's times of that pain. And you know what, sometimes, let me say this to you. When you become a believer and you enter into the church, you become involved in the church, you become involved in people's lives, not, not in the structure, you know, the, the, church is, the church is not about an organization, it is not a business, it is people. We are the people, the ecclesia. And when you enter into the ecclesia and you build relationships with people, and they are going through difficult times, so Diane, who runs our uh, ushers ministry, she came up to me and she said, my heart is broken. And I said to her, I know why your heart's broken, because mine is broken. 
because sitting across from us was Pete. And Pete is just going through right now the fight of his life. And seeing what he has and what Rose is going through with him. But we will experience times of pain. And you know what? It's easier. You live an isolated life, and maybe you only have to worry about your family. You know what happens when your family, you know, family, you know, and loved ones are sick, or your family or loved ones are ill, or they're going through a, a tough time? It breaks your heart. But now you come into the church, and now you start to build these relationships with people in the church, and you carry, you carry their pain with you. If you're distant from the fellowship, if you're distant from the ecclesia, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you as a pastor, you, you go through times, you live and die with people in their, in their pain and in their, their difficulties. And it, 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 it has an effect on you. So there, there, again, there will be painful times, times of grief. John chapter 20, verse 3 and 4 the day of the resurrection, right? Mary comes in and tells them, hey, we went to the tomb. He's not there. So it says this. They had a race, right? Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple. And uh, again, there's the other disciple. That's John. And we're going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. I think he, he, he was younger. He was a better, he wore more fleet of foot, but he outran him. He wanted us all to know that. <laughs> But could you, could you just, like, you know, you, you, this cartoon is a great picture. When they looked in to the tomb, right, there was the burial cloth. But it was basically, it looked as though the body had evaporated out of it. And there was the, the head cloth wrapped up, right, and we know what, what that means when a, a Hebrew man would have dinner, when um, he would wrap up, right, the cloth, it meant I'm coming back. When he would throw it down, he meant I'm not coming back. It was just significance in, in what was uh, going on there. And then there were, there were, let me just say, there were other, right, there are other wonderful appearances of the resurrection. I'm going to actually move on, but he appeared, right, he appeared to the 12, uh, actually to the 11, Thomas wasn't there, but he appeared to them in the upper room, right, the evening of the resurrection. He breathed on them. He said, receive the Spirit. He said, shalom to them twice. And he had that, just that, again, that, that was a, a wonderful renewing. When we're abiding in him, we experience his renewing. And then, you know, just later on, right, up at the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, they're fishing, six of them. John is in the boat. Peter's in the boat. Jesus is on shore. He's cooking breakfast for them. And, and he basically calls them, and what is it? Come and have breakfast with me. I say this, I have breakfast with Jesus every morning. Breakfast with Jesus every morning. And that is a, that is a wonderful experience. So from beginning, right, to the end and beyond. Because John continues to abide with Jesus. And that experience goes on through the book of Acts. And then again, many years later that we don't, you know, we don't know or record it. And ultimately come to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Right? John has been exiled to Patmos for the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. He is still abiding in Jesus. And Jesus is abiding in him. What does he say? It was the Lord's day and I was in the Spirit. Now, the experience that John has in Revelation, I believe is an experience that we one day will all have. But I don't think we will be here when we have it. And that is whether we are raptured or whether we die to go home to be with him. We separate from the physical body, but we will be with him. And I want to show, I want to show this video to you. And can we get sound? We have good sound? This, this is from... Uh, the movie with Richard Harris that covers the entire revelation. You can find it on YouTube. I think it's free. I'll ask you one question as we wrap up. What are you going to do when you see Jesus? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fall on my face because I am totally unworthy. 
for everything he has done for me. I'm totally unworthy for everything he has given to me, for the life that he laid down for me. I'm not going to stand in front of him and raise my hands. I'm not going to dance in front of him. I'm going to fall on my face. We are going to all have that experience one day for all of us who abide in Christ, who are standing before him. Isn't that great? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you, Lord God, for the example that we have in John. Lord, the reality of it. Your, your word is so real, Lord God, and it doesn't sugarcoat, Lord God, things. It, it shows, Lord, us in our sinfulness, but you, Lord God, in your grace and your glory. So I pray, Lord God, we take this to heart. We would, Lord God, that we would always know, Lord God, as a people who have put our faith in you, who are trusting in you, as the one who died for us on the cross, was raised from the dead, our God, our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah, that, Lord God, you abide in us. And, Lord God, may we just walk and abide with you through the thick and the thin, through the storms of life, Lord God, in the sunny days when we're on top of the mountains, Lord God, where we can hear the angels sing, and down in the valley where we can hear the demons hiss. Lord God, may we just abide in you. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.